Hello, my name is Kathleen and today I'm going to be talking about a project I've been working on for a little while, which is a circa 1740s jacket. In terms of materials for this project, I'm using this linen blend, this orange linen blend, and then some cotton, cabbage, and scraps for the lining and for patterns for the body of the jacket. I drafted my own pattern using the method from Mariah Patty's video about drafting 18th century patterns to your measurements, which I'll leave a link for in the description. It is a super great video and I loved how my pattern turned out um, working from it. I made my first mock-up and it, yeah, it fit the first time. There were still changes I needed to make. Um, stylistically, but in terms of fit, it was like right away good to go. So that was awesome. For the sleeve and cuff, I am using the sleeve and cuff pattern from the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Dressmaking from their 1740s English gown pattern. Um, and this book also was kind of my go-to when I had questions in terms of construction along the way. So I have my uh, mock-up, one of my mock-ups with me here just to kind of show the general gist of what it's gonna end up looking like. So I have this open front with a stomacher. This is gonna just have a pin closure, so no hooks and eyes or laces, just closed with pins. And then this peplum that, um, comes to points at each side seam. And this was actually a happy accident in the mock-up phase. I was originally planning to make the mock-up and then trim these points off to create a smooth curve. But I just ended up really liking how these little pointed pieces of the peplum looked. And so I decided to leave it. And um, yeah, I really liked that. Another influence on design for this project was that recently I've been doing some research into specifically Scottish Highland fashion in the early 18th century. I have been involved in Scottish Highland cultural events, mostly through dance for many, many years. And so it's been really great recently to tie this other interests this other passion of mine also back into that cultural research. Um, so that's been really fun. So I'm really excited to be able to wear this jacket in the future when I'm putting together specifically uniquely um, Scottish uh, ensembles. Without further ado, let's jump into the construction. I started by making the stomacher. Mine is currently three layers, the fashion fabric on the outside, lining, and between them a stiff inner lining layer. This inner lining should be buckram, which I don't have, but I did find a blog post from So Historically explaining how to make your own buckram using starch, which I do have. And one of the fabrics they suggested using as a base was cotton twill, which I had just the right amount left over from making my 1880s corset. So I decided to go with that. The lining was some plain white linen that I had left over from a different project. The important thing about this step is that the lining and inner lining are cut without seam allowance. So that when constructing the stomacher, you just wrap the seam allowance of the fashion fabric over the edges of the outer layers and stitch it down. I did this with the basting and hemming method. In the future, I would like to make this a reversible stomacher, but at the moment I don't have a fabric I want to use for the other side, so whenever I find one, I will just carefully stitch that to the other side. Another note about the stomacher, after having some difficulty with pinning the stomacher to my stays, added some tabs at either side of the top and the bottom out of just twill tape that is easier to pin through. So that just makes it a little simpler to attach them to my stays. Unlike modern garments where the fashion fabric and lining layers are constructed separately and then attached during the 18th century for jackets and bodices, what tended to be done was 
each piece of the garment, the fashion fabric and lining would be treated as one layer. So the steps of lining and connecting the panels were done at the same time. This allowed for alterations and reconstruction to be a lot easier. And the reason for this was the price of fabric. Now in the 18th century, you didn't go to a store and buy a finished garment. You would buy fabric and take it to a tailor or a mantua maker who would make the garment. And by comparison, the cost of labor from the mantua maker or tailor was relatively inexpensive. So buying silk or printed cotton or whatever to make your dress that fabric was an investment. So instead of buying new fabric and having new dresses made every time the fashion changed, you would take that same fabric and have it remade time and time again as the styles changed. Abby Cox has a really interesting video about how clothing was bought and made in the 18th century and I will link it below. I would highly recommend watching it. I found it just really fascinating, really interesting. That tangent aside, let's get back to actually making the jacket. So I'm just connecting the back of the jacket for now. What you can see I've done is I line up the two pieces, the um, fashion fabric and the lining fabric, and then turn the seam allowances in towards each other so that those raw edges are on the inside, sandwiched between the two, and then baste them together. So we end up with that. And now how the seams themselves are connected is by taking each of these panels and putting them right sides together. And then I'm going to use what is called the English seam. So how the English stitch is done, what's important is to think of these two panels laid up together as four layers in total. So we have lining, fashion fabric, fashion fabric, lining. So how this stitch is done is essentially by going through three layers of fabric at a time. We'll call this lining one and lining two. So I'm, I'll skip lining one and stitch through the other three layers. Then I'm gonna skip lining two and stitch through the other three layers. And I do that back and forth and back and forth. So what it'll look like on one side is this. It'll kind of, it'll have these slanted stitches and I probably could be doing smaller stitches, but this spacing works just fine. And then once it's done, the finished seam folded out like this, just looks like that. I continued with this method for the rest of those main vertical seams. of jump around to different parts of the project for no reason instead of doing things in an order that makes sense, I next went to prep the sleeves and cuffs. And technically I did have a reason for doing things in this order, but it's not a good one. I knew that I was going to be in the car for a really long time and I wanted something that I could just do mindlessly while in the car, but mostly it was Fitting the shoulder strap scares me, and so I was procrastinating on that. But at least sometimes procrastination can be productive for something else. So anyway, sleeves and cuffs. I began by basting along the stitching line on the fashion fabric, and although this isn't strictly necessary, I like it because my chalk lines tend to get smudged over time, and it lets me see the stitching line from both sides of the fabric. With wrong sides together, I used this line to turn the seam allowances of the fashion fabric and the lining inward, the same as I did for the vertical seams of the bodice. The major difference being that here I made sure that the lining fabric sat well within the 
the fashion fabric, leaving that bit of orange visible around the white lining. This makes sure that the lining won't peek out around the edge of the fashion fabric when it's finished. I used the same method I just showed for the cuffs for the bottom edge of the sleeves as well, and also to secure the fashion fabric and lining layers at the center front opening of the jacket together, that edge that will be pinned to the stomacher. With the fashion fabric and lining basted together across the sleeve head, I also made the sleeve seam with a back stitch and pressed the seam allowances open. And with that, the sleeves were ready to be set. And then it had come time for the dreaded and unavoidable shoulder straps. Now, I have unfortunately lost most of the footage I took of the process of fitting and setting the shoulder straps and sleeves, but nevertheless, I'm gonna do my very best to talk through it real quick. Now, I didn't have a specific pattern piece for the shoulder straps. On the mock-up, I just cut out a rectangle that I knew was a lot longer than I needed it to be and just fiddled around to, okay, and now that's how I like it. And then I took a pattern piece from that. Um, even with doing the mock-up, once I got on the jacket, I still had some adjustments to do but most of those were pretty minor. When it comes to setting the sleeves, 18th century sleeve setting is a little weird and I'm gonna do my best to explain it, but I will also link some American Duchess videos and blog posts down in the description that were really helpful for me when I was going through the process. So I would very much recommend looking at those. The first thing you do is attach the shoulder straps, which is only the lining layer. So stitching only the lining later to the front and back of the bodice. And an important thing for this is to make sure the seam allowances are already folded in. So there's that folded edge instead of a raw edge on the outside. This is something that I learned by totally messing it up uh, on the first time that I made an 18th century bodice. But because I messed it up then, I knew what to do now and it was a lot simpler. For this arrow, you don't turn the garment inside out for fitting. You actually just turn the raw edge of the top of the sleeve under and pin it directly to the right side of the fabric, just pinning it where it is comfortable. And this is the stage where you determine the depth of the arm's eye. So how deep down the fabric is going to go under your arm. So for earlier stages, don't worry if you start to feel like there's just the fabrics coming up too high under your arm. You will get that figured out at this stage and then however much excess there is, you just cut it out. And that might sound scary, but for me, there was like a good inch of excess that I just, you just trim it right out. Now for actually setting the sleeves, this would ideally be a two-person process, but because I was making this jacket for and by myself, I did the next best thing, uh, which is just trial and error. So I put the jacket up on my dress form, although this would work just as well hanging it on a normal hanger pinned the sleeves where I thought they should go, tried it on, made notes of, okay, what adjustments do I need to make to take it off, hang it back up, make those adjustments, repeat, 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 until eventually I was satisfied with that. When it comes to the part of the sleeve head that would be attached to the shoulder strap, you are going to have a lot of excess. And once the rest of your sleeve is set, that is then where you're going to ease this in. Um, you don't need to turn the seam allowance under because this part of the sleeve head is going to be encased between the lining and fashion fabric of the shoulder strap. So all you need to do is pleat it to ease it in. I originally did three small pleats on each shoulder, but I ended up not really liking how this looked. And so in the end, I changed this to just one deep pleat that took out all the excess so it fit right in. I set the sleeves using the pin turning method, 
which I'll link a video um, from American Duchess that explains this better, but basically it involves fitting the sleeves from the outside and then using these pins to mark exactly where the sleeve, where you want the sleeve to meet the body of the jacket. And then on the inside, using where those pins come through the fabric to trace the stitching lines. So I have that traced on both sleeves. I just used pen since it's on the inside lining. I knew that wouldn't smudge how pencil or chalk might. So I just went with that and I'm gonna sew these in with a back stitch and I'll be right back. With the sleeves stitched in place, I trimmed the excess seam allowance to roughly 3 eighths of an inch and moved on to the outer layer of the shoulder strap. For this, I folded all of the seam allowances under and did my best to line it up with everything underneath and then I stitched it in place. Originally, I followed the instructions from the American Duchess book and did a whip stitch on the short edges and a prick stitch for the long edges. I ended up not really liking how the prick stitch looked and so I went back and just whip stitched around all of the edges. Okay, so I'm going to walk through making the cuffs real quick. So I have one finished already, so here's that. And I'm just going to real quick talk through what goes into making this before uh, showing the other one. So the first thing, and this you can see on the other cuff, is the pleats are marked on the outside in chalk. Um, and then with right sides together, these two edges are whip stitched together. Uh, so just over the edge and that's pressed flat. Then the pleats are pleated towards the straight edge, not the curved edge. And then pinned in place, and that's a whole process. That took, that took me a while. I'm hoping it'll be easier now that I've already done it once. And then the pleats are secured down. I was kind of surprised by the instructions that it is a visible stitch on the outside, and it is a very small stitch. It is a prick stitch, which ends up looking a lot like a running stitch, but only going over one or two threads at a time. Then it is ready to be attached to the sleeve. I opted for the open style cuff for this jacket. I just prefer how it looks to the winged cuff, but unfortunately I couldn't find many reference images that would give me a good look at how they were attached. Is it just the one edge attached or is it both? How far around is it stitched? Where on the arm should the pleats lay? All of these things I could get an okay idea of looking at portraits and extant garments, but I was still pretty unsure. Then I found a blog post from the Antique Sewist about making a 1760s jacket, but which had this exact style of cuff. And best of all, she included pictures of the finished jacket from every angle, so I could really get a good look at how she dealt with the sleeves and cuffs. And that helped so much in getting these attached. Next thing to do on the jacket was hemming. And full disclosure, on the first 18th century gown I made, my least favorite part about the whole thing once it was all done is the hemming around the back of the neck. So for this take two, I really wanted to get it right. Just based on how many layers they are and particularly the bulkiness at the seams, I knew I wouldn't be able to do the typical method of turning under twice. Because these pieces are individually lined instead of having a separate lining layer and outer layer, I couldn't just turn the seam allowances towards each other. What I opted to do was use some of my extra orange linen to create a facing along the inside. So I did this along the back of the neck and also along the whole edge of the peplum. To do this, I turned the raw edges under just once and then used the facing piece, which also had its seam allowances turned under once, to cover up that raw edge. I pinned this in place and stitched it all around with a whip stitch. 
This also has the benefit of making sure the lining doesn't peek out from right along the edge, especially on the peplum. Okay, so here I have the finished facing for the back of the neckline. I'm really happy with how it turned out, honestly. Um, I think it gives it a much nicer finish on the outside than simply hemming it normally would. And the felling stitches are ever so slightly visible from the outside, but only if you're really looking for them. One thing I would do differently and that I'm planning to do differently for the facings along the hem is this piece I cut out of the cabbage, but I cut it on the straight of grain. So I managed to kind of curve it along this edge to finish, to fit where I needed to get up onto the shoulder straps just slightly. I managed to curve it, but it's a little bunchy. Um, I wish I'd cut it on the bias, then I could have done that little bit of stretch that I needed to, and I'm definitely planning to cut the facing for the hem on the bias to hopefully fix that problem. I'm on pretty much the very last step of the jacket, which is sewing the cuffs on. This one I've done already. For the stitches, I've used a spaced prick stitch, which is essentially this very, very small stitch in the outside that's almost invisible. And then between them is about a half a centimeter space um, on the inside. So how these cuffs are done, they are stitched most of the way around, but then this back part of the cuff is left loose. I am still not super confident that I've placed these correctly or that I've stitched them the right amount around, but because this stitch is one that's relatively easy to take out and is not very labor intensive in the first place, I'm pretty okay with where I've got them set at the moment. So I'm going to go ahead and stitch the other one on and then I'll be done. And if at any point in the future, I really don't like how the positioning is or how, just how it's sitting, I can pretty easily take them off and fix them. And with that finished, it's time for the grand reveal. I'm so happy with how this turned out. I really love how it looks and I really love how it looks, especially with my Scottish style accessories. I've yet to wear it with my more Americanized 18th century wardrobe, but I'm excited to do that at some point in the future. In terms of practicality, let me tell you, I was out in the nastiest, rainiest, sleetiest weather to film these clips and between my jacket and my mitts, I was totally fine. Like the only part of me that was cold was my ears, which weren't covered, so. Overall, this was a really fun project and a really fun adventure into pattern making and experimenting with pattern making. And I will definitely be using this system of drafting in the future. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this video and have a lovely day. Happy sewing.